This week on the CNET Tech Review, someone's in the kitchen with Sharon and her favorite cooking apps. HTC gets a status update with its new Facebook phone. How to transfer photos from Facebook to Google Plus and get ready to rack up some high scores with this iPad arcade cabinet. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, plus offer some unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start with the good. First up today, we've got something for all the foodies out there. There is no shortage of great recipes and cooking tips available on the internet, and there are plenty of great apps for the iPad that help bring that knowledge into the kitchen. Here's Sharon Vaknin with a few of her favorites. Hey everyone, welcome to Tap That App. I'm Sharon Vaknin and today I'm hanging out in the Chow Test Kitchen to talk about three apps that all you home chefs, seasoned or aspiring, will love. They're all available on the iPad, which is a perfect kitchen companion with its large screen and gorgeous apps like the Photo Cookbook. Launch it and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. This $5 app gives you step-by-step -step photo instructions of about 80 gourmet but basic recipes. It's a great way to get comfortable in the kitchen since not only are the instructions easy to follow, but you also learn about ingredients in the process. Tapping on an ingredient in a recipe will give you its description, ways to prepare it, and other related items. If you decide that you want to email yourself the ingredients, Photo Cookbook lets you do that with just a few taps. When you're ready to expand your culinary knowledge, you can buy up to 180 more Asian, Italian, and baking recipes in the app. Now, if that's too fancy for you, check out the All Recipes app. All Recipes is actually an online community where people like you and me submit their own recipes. And let me tell you from experience, there are some amazing ideas on there. So with this app, you can access the entire collection on your iPad in a pretty interface. Do a search for a dish you want to make, browse by filters like course or ingredient, or check out the hand-picked featured recipes. Each recipe is accompanied by reviews, nutritional information, and the option to change the serving size to make more or less of the dish. All Recipes is probably my favorite place to find original recipes, besides chow of course, but even with all these recipes at hand, you'll need to build your culinary knowledge. It won't replace culinary school, but Smart Chef Suite will help you out with conversions, substitutions, and definitions while you're cooking. For instance, if a recipe calls for breadcrumbs, but I have none of that in my kitchen, the nice little owl will tell me that I can use cracker crumbs, matzo meal, or ground oats instead. You can also convert things like pints to cups and get vocabulary lessons from the definitions section. Like, what the heck is ajinomoto? All right, well, good thing we checked because it's Japanese for MSG. So pick your recipes, master your kitchen skills, and satisfy your hunger with these three apps. For more episodes of Tap That App, check out CNET TV and tell us what your favorite apps are on our Facebook page. I'm Sharon Vaknin. Happy cooking. I suppose if you do plan to use the iPad while you're cooking, it might be worth investing in a case. Hopefully one that can go in the dishwasher. And when dinner time is over and the dishes are all done, might I suggest you retire to the arcade for some casual retro gaming? You can do just that with this new iPad accessory from Ion Audio. I'm Dan Ackerman and we are here taking a look at the Ion Audio IK. The IK actually started life as an April Fool's gag from Think Geek, uh, the big online gadget and other weird stuff store. They just did a mock-up and said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you can get a little arcade cabinet for your iPad? People like the idea so much. ThinkGeek actually went out and found a company, Ion, to make it for them. So now you can actually buy the iCade for 99 bucks. What you get for your 99 bucks is basically a particle board mini arcade cabinet. You have to screw it together yourself, connect it to a Bluetooth joystick and button set. So you put a couple of AA batteries in here, sync it via Bluetooth to your iPad. Then you take your iPad and you just flip open the top 
and you drop the uh, iPad right in here. It doesn't actually connect to the cradle or anything. It just sort of sits in it, so you don't want to move this around. Otherwise, it'll jostle everything. And then uh, you launch the Atari Greatest Hits iOS game. That is the only game that currently works with the iCade. However, it does give you a hundred different classic Atari arcade and console games for about 15 bucks. Uh, that's a pretty good deal, especially if you're interested in that kind of classic gaming. Once you do that, you pick the game you want to play. A lot of these classic games were actually meant to work with trackballs or other kinds of controls, not joysticks. Uh, some of it's a little bit awkward, but a lot of them work really well. Uh, you're going to have to go through the 100 games and find the ones that work best for you. For 100 bucks, the iCade is basically an expensive novelty. It's a desktop toy, but it's a very cool-looking one, especially if you're into vintage gaming. Uh, the company that makes this has released an SDK, or a software development kit, that will allow people who make other iOS games to make an iCade-compatible version of that game. We have not seen that yet, but if people start doing that, uh, the iCade is going to be a lot more useful. I'm Dan Ackerman, and that is the Ion Audio iCade. The best part? You don't even need any quarters, unless you want to put one up to claim the next game. Given how ubiquitous Facebook has become, it was only a matter of time before we saw a dedicated Facebook phone. And that time has come courtesy of HTC. Let's see how much Bonnie Cha likes it. Hey everyone, I'm Bonnie Ta, senior editor at CNET.com, and we are here in New York at a special event with AT&T showing off the HTC status. This is the Facebook optimized phone. What it has here is a dedicated Facebook button, so you can press it to post a status update, share news stories, as well as any music you're listening to. Uh, you can also share photos by pressing the button here. A uh, short press will take you to the screen where you can post status updates. If you do a long press, it will allow you to check into location so you can share with everyone else on your Facebook wall. Otherwise, it's running Android 2.3 Gingerbread. It has a 2.6 inch screen. It's HVDA quality. It's a little small, but you know, for the intended audience, I think it's okay. On back, you've got a five megapixel camera, and on front, there's also a VGA camera, so you can do video calls. Another Facebook feature, it has a chat client, so you can instant message with your friends. Also got a full QWERTY keyboard. Buttons are a good size, and they're raised above the surface, so they're easy to press. It'll be available starting July 17th for a very affordable $49.99 with a two-year contract. So I think it's going to do really well with uh, the younger crowd who loves to social network, especially Facebook. So uh, looking forward to trying it out. And I'm Bonnie Chan. This has been your first look at the HTC status for AT&T. Of course, if you're already over Facebook and you've made the commitment to Google+, that's not going to be the phone for you. But before you forget about Facebook completely, Sharon's here again to help you gather up your things and leave. Unless you've been using a service like Picasa or Flickr to store your photos, I bet that most of your pictures are on Facebook. It makes sense since you want to put photos where your friends can see them, but if you're switching to Google+, or using both networks, you should share your pictures on there too. I'm Sharon Vakden for CNET.com, here to show you how to move your photos from Facebook to Google+. Basically, what we need to do is download your Facebook album so that you can easily re-upload them to Google+. Lots of free online tools let you do this, but I have a couple favorites. As always, your best bet is to use Facebook's built-in data downloader because it's a guaranteed safe and proprietary tool. The only annoying part about getting your photos this way is that it takes a few hours to a day for Facebook to email you the download link. Go to your account settings, then hit download your information. Once the download is ready, you'll get a zip folder of your Facebook info like messages and wall posts and all your photos organized into folders by album. But if you're more of a want it now kind of person, check out Pick and Zip. It's a free web app that lets you download albums plus any photos that you've been tagged in. Just go to pickandzip.com, log in with Facebook, head to download, and select download all photos. If you have a ton of pictures, this might take a while. I had about 3,500 and it took five minutes. The download will come as a zipped folder, which you should decompress, usually by double-clicking it on a Mac or selecting Extract All Files in Windows. You'll see an Albums folder with all your albums and a Tagged folder with all the photos you've been tagged in. Once you have your Facebook photos on your computer, it's time to head to Google+. Go to View Profile, then Photos, 
and upload new photos. Here, you can create one album at a time. You can't upload all your album folders at once. Click Select Photos from Computer, find an album you want to upload, select the photos in that folder, and hit Open. Once the photos are uploaded, give the album a name and hit Create Album. Here, you can add a comment about the album, which will show up in your stream, and decide which circles you want to share it with. If you want it to be private, just enter your own name or email address. Share it, and the album will show up in the streams of the people you shared it with and in the Photos tab on your profile. You can always change the album privacy options by going to Photos, then View All Your Albums, click the album you want to edit, and change the Visible To option. And here's an extra tip. Unlike Facebook, Google Plus has a built-in photo editor. Click on a photo and select Actions. You can rotate the photo or click Edit Photo for coloring effects like cross-processing or black and white. In this view, you can also tag people in your photos by selecting Add Tag and entering the person's name or email address if they're not on Google Plus yet. So go ahead and move your photo memories to Google Plus, especially if you think you'll be spending more time there than Facebook. And feel free to leave behind any baggage you're ready to retire. For more how-tos, visit howto.cnet.com and feel free to ask me any questions on my Facebook page. For CNET, I'm Sharon Vaknin, and I'll see you on the interwebs. Consider this your opportunity to do some spring cleaning as well. I know everyone has some snapshots that have been posted to Facebook that have no business being there, myself included. Thanks for putting up the old high school pics, buddies, haha. -ha. In fact, let's take a break so I can go delete those photos right now. But don't go too far, we've still got a lot more tech review right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Continuing on in the good. Many of us have come to depend on GPS navigation to get us where we're going, which is great as long as it doesn't steer you directly into a traffic jam. That's where live traffic monitoring comes in and where the latest version of the TomTom Tom Go really shines. Even if you're headed to a familiar place in a very familiar city, a GPS device with traffic data can still be useful for dodging traffic jams. TomTom Tom has a new trick up its sleeve that aims to deliver more accurate traffic straight to your dashboard. I'm Antoine Goodwin with CNET.com. Let's take a first look at the TomTom Tom Go 2535 M Live. The Go 2535 M Live packs many of the same features that we saw earlier this year in TomTom's Go 2405 including a glass capacitive touchscreen, this time it's a 5-inch unit as opposed to a 4.3-inch one, and an asymmetrically designed metallic chassis that snaps into its cradle with the power of magnetism. Interestingly, the GO 2535's power cable features a detachable 12-volt to USB adapter, so you won't get a separate USB sync cable in the box this time. On the bright side, the GO 2535 Live gains the ability to use its traffic and live services without the power cable being connected, because TomToms moved the data receiver into the unit's main body as opposed to housing it in the cord like on previous models. You'll be able to get the latest weather conditions and forecasts, find the lowest fuel prices nearby, search for points of interest with Google Local Search, avoid speed and safety cameras if you're a little paranoid, and get live traffic updates. Now that last bit's worth dwelling on because this isn't just regular RDS traffic, but it's TomToms latest generation of HD traffic. TomTom Tom claims that this HD traffic service updates more frequently, more accurately, and on more roads than standard municipal traffic services. TomTom's Tom's Live Connected services are free for the first year of ownership. The Go 2535 Live also features TomTom's Tom's new interface, which was updated early in 2011, which takes advantage of the capacitive touchscreen for things like pinch and zoom on the map and swipe to scroll in the menu. There are also fewer menu levels than previous TomTom Tom generations, with the main functions of Navigate 2, view map and plan route sitting at top level on the main screen. Oh, and by the way, the M in Go 2535 M Live means that this baby will get free map updates for as long as you own it. I'm going to go chase down some traffic jams to see how accurate the Go 2535 Live's HD traffic service actually is and how much time it can save me. I've been Antoine Goodwin. To find out what I think, look for the full review of the TomTom Tom Go 2535 M Live on CNET.com.
I could definitely use one of those to help get around town whenever there's a Giants game going on down the street. Also, I wonder how Tom Tom would handle Carmageddon in LA this weekend. Be strong, people. Let's see what's up this week in the bad. Now, if you're going to take the time to wire your living room or your home theater for surround sound, I'd hope you would also take the time to choose a speaker system that not only sounds good, but at least looks halfway decent too. In which case, I would hope you skip this new set from Klipsch. Hey, I'm Matthew Muscoviak at CNET.com, and this is the Klipsch HD Theater 500. This is a 5.1 speaker system, and it can be found online for less than $500. The system is made up of four small satellite speakers, a center channel, and a 100-watt subwoofer. The speaker cabinets are plastic, and the grills on the front are removable, revealing a 0.75-inch tweeter and a 2.5-inch woofer. Wall mounts are included for the satellites, and they offer the ability to angle the speakers at up to a 20-degree angle, either left or right. The subwoofer is average size for a system like this, and there's an 8-inch driver on the bottom. While the Klipsch system looks pretty stylish, we were disappointed by the cheap speaker connectors on the back. They have a spring clip design that only accepts bare speaker wire, and they don't make as much of a secure connection as we'd like. And while this is a budget speaker system, many competitors have better connectors on the back. The most important aspect of any speaker system is its sound quality. And while the Klipsch sounds a whole lot better than many of the sound bars and home theater in a box systems we test, it didn't sound quite as good stacked up against other budget speaker systems. When we played action movies like Black Hawk Down at high volumes, the s small satellites started to sound strained and not quite as powerful as the competing Energy Take Classic 5.1 system. Music wasn't much better either, and again, it didn't fare well when we tried to get loud. However, if you tend to listen at relatively low volumes or you watch less sonically demanding movies, the Klipsch can sound quite good as long as you don't push it too hard. Altogether, while the Klipsch HD Theater 500 is a competent budget surround sound system, we prefer a lot of its competitors at this price range. The Energy Take Class system offers better sound quality at around the same size, and if you can put up with larger speakers, the Pioneer SP PK21BS delivers unbeatable sound for the money. If you find the Klipsch HD Theater at a heavy discount, it's not a bad system, but we generally prefer the alternatives. I'm Matthew Muscoviak, and this is the Klipsch HD Theater 500. $500 is not a lot to pay for a 5.1 surround sound system, but if it looks like it was made for $50, I'm not sure it's really such a good bargain. I promise you'll get more bang for your buck in this week's Bottom Line. From Android to WebOS and, of course, iOS, we're up to our necks with tablets around here these days, which is all the more reason to revisit our top tablet picks in this week's Top 5 Countdown. Hello, gang. Last time I brought you a list of Top 5 tablets, a lot of it was, well, hooey. That's because many of the contenders for the iPad's crown were still yet to go on the market and undergo the withering tests. Our lab and your opinion. Well, that's all changed now, and the henchmen are lined up. I'm Brian Cooley with the top five tablets, iPad and otherwise. Let's go shopping. Number five is the T-Mobile G Slate. We like that it has 4G support and Android Honeycomb all rammed into one device, and pre-installed streaming TV apps that work quite nicely. But then there's this built-in 3D camcorder thing which uses those cheapy red and blue glasses? Seriously? No, the 3D on this thing is just a gimmick. Don't get misled. Beyond that, this is also kind of a pricey device. 800 bucks, unless you do a two-year hitch with a carrier who's likely gonna be gobbled up by another carrier halfway through that hitch. It's just kind of messy. Number four is the BlackBerry Playbook. A lot of folks are out there in the audience right now playing the funeral dirge, as I mentioned this one. But the playbook is actually kind of hot. It's fast, powerful, flash-enabled, HDMI equipped, a multitasking wonder. But the seven-inch size crams all that power on too small a stage. And it's too tied to the BlackBerry platform at a time when many folks are going a different direction. Number three is the improbably named ASUS ePad Transformer. It actually does transform. Is it a honeycomb tablet or a netbook? Yes. 
you see you can dock it into a keyboard docking station that answers one of the biggest frustrations we all have with tablets, that there's no way to really type. You're always hunting and pecking on that touch screen. Now, it's pretty hefty, kind of wide, kind of thick, kind of heavy, eh, and that's without the dock. But the price is pretty good. $400 list for a 16 gigabyte model, and the keyboard dock is a reasonable $150 more. Number two is one of the very first serious iPad 2 challengers, the Samsung Galaxy Tab 10.1. This is the big boy in their line. Super thin, it runs the hot Honeycomb OS, front and rear cameras, and alarmingly powerful speakers. Now, while we love its meth addict thin lines, we didn't like how Samsung got there. The back feels cheap and plasticky and likely to break if you drop it even once. Not exactly Apple build quality. But if you're looking for something that isn't Apple, this is our go-to choice right now. Okay, before I bring you to our number one tablet, let me remind you of what may be the best value in a tablet. It's the Barnes & Noble Nook Color. That's right, it's ostensibly an e-reader. But with a little bit of technical acumen, you can do what's called rooting of this device and fully expose the Android operating system that lies within. That's not a lot of sweat to break to get yourself a real good Android tablet for $250 or less. We've got a link to the step-by-step -step directions to root one of these devices in our show notes at top5.cnet.com. Think about it. Okay, if you're really bad at things like process of elimination games, I will tell you the number one tablet. It's the Apple iPad 2. It's thin, it's got dual cameras now, dual core processor, that FaceTime video chat, and two carrier choices for your 3G models. That slick cover still looks like a damn magic trick, and it has a huge and well-vetted store of apps. That said, its screen resolution and ratio is still stuck back in iPad 1 territory. The photo quality is inexplicably lousy, and there's no support for flash. But you'll have days of battery life to ponder those few shortcomings and to be part of the vast majority who think a tablet is an iPad. Okay, before you go buy any tablet, these five or some other, make sure you check out our reviews, our latest reviews at CNET.com, because the tablet category is hot and new models are coming out fast and furious right now. For more top fives like this, go to top5.cnet.com. I'm Brian Cooley. Thanks for watching. The bottom line this week, was there ever any doubt? You could kind of see number one coming from a mile away, but good on Asus for making it on the list. All right, folks, that's our show. Come back next week for an all new CNET Tech review, including our hands-on impressions of the Spotify music service. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. See you next time, and thank you for watching.